for me, it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce John Marzlaff. This is the second time that I have the pleasure, surely not often enough, because the last time I had the pleasure was, in fact, exactly 10 years ago. But I will tell you a short thing about that later on. John Marzlaff is James W. Ridgway Professor of Wildlife Science at the University of Washington. His graduate research, which took place at Northern Arizona University, and his initial postdoctoral research, which took place at University of Vermont, focused on the social behavior and ecology of jays and ravens. He continues this theme investigating the intriguing behavior of crows, ravens, and jays. His current research focuses on the interactions of ravens and wolves in Yellowstone. He teaches ornithology, governance, and conservation of rare species, field research in Yellowstone, and natural and cultural history of Costa Rica. He has written six books and edited several others. His welcome to Suburbia, 2014 Yale, discovers that moderately settled lands host a splendid array of biological diversity and suggests ways in which people can steward these riches to benefit birds and themselves. His most recent book, In Search of Meadow Larks, 2020, Yale, uh, connects our agriculture and diets to the conversation, conservation of birds and other wildlife. He has mentored over 40 graduate students and authored over 170 scientific papers on various aspects of bird behavior and wildlife management. He's a member of the United States Fish and Wildlife Services Recovery Team for the Critically Endangered Mariana Crow, a former member of the Washington Biodiversity Council, a fellow of the American Ornithologist Union and the National Geographic Explorer. I personally first got to know uh, about John through um, searching for some useful literature on urban ecology some about 12 uh, years ago or so. And I came across about on a book on urban ecology published by Springer in 2008, uh, where John was uh, the lead editor, if I understood correctly. Um, and um, at that time, when I came across this book, um, I had the chance to be uh, responsible for organizing a series of symposia that were hosted uh, by Cornell University in the uh, Strauss Sustainability Series. And that kicked off in 2012 uh, under the title Sustaining Sustainability and uh, looked at how urban planning and design and architecture can move closer towards uh, facilitating urban ecology, whereby architecture, of course, remained to date the furthest away. Um, and there is still a lot of work to be done. And I recall in this symposium, uh, John showed some absolutely stunning videos on experiments done with urban crows. And I learned for the first time there that birds have such a thing, if I remember the term correctly, as generational memory. But uh, I don't want to uh, preempt anything that might be coming in this talk. And um, for those of you that are interested, there are really a whole series of amazingly interesting um, videos on YouTube uh, on various presentations that uh, John has got given about this topic. So without further ado, John, it is my really great pleasure to welcome you tonight. And um, it's over to you. Thanks very much, Michael, and, and uh, for everybody for inviting me and, and for the work you guys are doing, uh, trying to coordinate and, and link together the human built and natural world. I think it's it's a great project. What I'm going to talk about today is a pretty general uh, review of some of the bird work that we've done that, that connects it to um, more landscape change than actual the orientation or the design of the building, but uh, certainly speaks to the plant and animal succession. Uh, that was in uh, Ferdinand's model that he showed us. And hopefully we'll, we'll show some of the detailed connections of, of birds and people in, in that space. 
So I'll share my screen. And as as Michael said, this this book or this talk comes about from a, a book that summarizes a lot of uh, 10 to 12 years of work that my colleagues and I did on urban ecology here uh, in the Seattle area, but also in um, in concert with colleagues in Berlin. Uh, we had a great joint program with with both um, Berlin and Seattle as our kind of host cities and demonstration cities. And the work I'll show you today uh, will have data, but also illustrations by one of my students who is graduating in just a couple of weeks, uh, Jack DeLapp. I'd like to start with this image, is, which is of an animal you will not see in a city or anywhere near one uh, for that matter. This is a Baird's tapir from Costa Rica. And this is an animal that requires big wild space far away from people. And, and some animals do. And I'm, I'm not really talking about those today. I think they're very important and it's important to set aside reserves really the, the best strategy for their conservation, maybe even mobile reserves given the changes in the world and how reserves are impacted in, in a given place. But these, these animals require areas beyond the city. And so just to keep that in mind, I'll kind of come back to that because I hope, and I think you all hope that the work we do within the city might inform people's views about conserving animals even beyond the city. This is more the typical development envelope that I see <clears throat> in my area. Um, this is a, a developing area just outside of Seattle. We had all forest, uh, second growth forest. It had been logged over about 100 years ago, but has grown up to quite substantial um, coniferous and deciduous forest that is being um, punctuated by new developments, some of which like this are quite spread out uh, large yards and then new roads coming in, fragmenting the forest and affecting the animals and people that live within those. And we were interested in particular how the diversity of birds, the number of bird species might react to the loss of forest in that setting. So in this graph, you see the number of bird species that we would count on a typical survey as a function of how much forest is left within a kilometer square area around our survey point. And when we don't have much forest left, we have uh, a small number of birds, still a, a fairly substantial in some places, 20 or more species of birds that live in those highly developed city cores. But as we move further from the city out into areas that include more and more forest, we increase the number of species of birds. And that's something we expected really, I think as conservation biologists, more natural habitat, more wildlife. The problem is if you keep going, that drops off. So if you go all the way out to the, to the reserved areas we have, which are mainly set aside for water security, um, those, the number of birds again drops, the diversity drops. And so what we end up with is a peak here in, in what I call suburbia. So this is the area that has a combination of built uh, and uh, natural areas. It is highly interspersed with uh, the fragments you saw on the early slide of fingers of forest with built areas around, some open space with grass, other with shrubs, maybe some recreational places, golf courses and things like that, all of which provide new resources or different resources in close proximity and therefore allow the different species of birds, in our case, to utilize those different uh, resources and increase the diversity. Mammals, it's not quite as clear that you would see a peak like this. You would, you would see a peak, but it'd be mostly from invasion of non-native species. Whereas most of the birds in the circle here, in our case, all but three species uh, in, in my study area are native forest species that use different stages of the forest succession. And I indicate some of those here, these names aren't gonna be familiar to, to you, but I think the general idea is, and that is we have some species that really take advantage of us like crows or wrens or chickadees, what, what you call tits. We have other species that benefit from early successional forests that we provide typically uh, in our um, area. Some of our sparrows and flycatchers are ones that specialize on rather open shrubby lands 
And those species like this white crown sparrow come in and, and take advantage uh, of those new kind of habitats that are created in a city. <clears throat> Just to, to um, make it, I think, a little easier to, to grip what I'm talking about, we can name these different groups and we can talk about the group that, that definitely requires uh, contiguous forests, typically very intolerant of people like the tapir I started with as a avoiders. And, and the nightingale is, is an example uh, from your uh, area or even the jackdaw I would put in this uh, classification because they've tended to decline as, as cities have become um, less appealing to them in terms of providing niches for them to breed in. Now, some cities still provide everything a jackdaw needs and loves, but, but not as much as they used to. Uh, some of the woodpeckers decline as well. So as forest or natural habitat of whatever kind is lost, these species decline. Other species adapt, so we call them adapters. The tits are a good example, great tit here. Even the goshawk in Europe is a good example of an adapter that has, because of persecution outside the city, become more at home within the city. And peregrine would be another one uh, in, in your world, uh, or the blackbird. So these species take advantage of these habitats that are provided because that's what they use outside of the city for the most part. And then there are the exploiters. These are the ones that really take advantage of the, the built area, your, your hooded crows, for example, some of the non-native parrots that live in London uh, and other places, uh, and even some of the owls that specialize on using our structures, the barn owl here, for example. So if you think about those three groups, what we saw in that curve that showed a peak in the suburban area was kind of the accumulation of a little bit of, of avoiders, a little bit of exploiters, and a whole lot of those adapters uh, that came in and took advantage of that setting. And the actual shape of that curve, whether it peaks in the middle, uh, is a function of the colonization and extinction of species in our lands. So I've tried to show that here with some of the variation that might occur. Maybe something like this is useful as you think about the shape of this curve around uh, buildings and areas that you are designing. So what I have here is just the, what, what would happen as we went from very little native vegetation to a lot of native vegetation. And for example, this is the humped curve that we saw with overall species diversity. But that's a function in Seattle because we had a lot of colonization of species from those early successional stages in particular. So there's a real peak in the uh, areas that have a, a moderate amount of settlement and a moderate amount of natural lands. And that's because we have a lot of colonization. Now in some areas, in, in Asia, for example, oftentimes the, the built and natural lands are quite distinct and they're not interspersed like we have here in Seattle. And therefore, we might see a much lower colonization curve in that respect, and maybe not as much of a peak in diversity in the middle. And it might even be wiped out if we have a lot of colonization uh, of species that take advantage of built areas because there's other built areas close by. So I, I think of Europe in many ways as, as being a situation where we might have rapid colonization of the species that can live with us because there are many cities close by as compared to the Western United States, at least, where we have a lot of isolated cities and um, more difficulty perhaps or slower colonization. So we might have a uh, reduction in this source in our area and an increase in your area. And then with respect to extinction, again, depending upon uh, how intensely used the land is, and how they interface with the other um, source areas for species that require areas away from people. Um, we might have a reduction in extinction or we might have a great um, increase in the extinction of species. So thinking about those processes, and I think you had them as, you had them as dispersal or, or colonization in discovery of the city. Um, that's what I'm talking about here. I think those, those are the processes that are important, but then to split it up by what kind of species we're talking about, which ones are colonizing, which ones are going extinct as well, might help us understand what we might expect in an area. And in fact, you can see that to some extent 
uh, in this little matrix that, that we made uh, looking at basically how much urban land cover could be tolerated uh, by various species. When did they drop in or drop out of the assemblage of birds? And what we have here is each of the columns uh, is a particular study site. It's just, we just ordered from low to high amount of urban uh, land cover. And the species, which are each row in this matrix are those that are very tolerant of development and those that are intolerant. So we have the uh, exploiters, the adapters and the avoiders uh, in, in our other parlance uh, shown here. And math statistically, you can just come up with a threshold line, the red line here, when these species drop out uh, where there's too much urban development for them to, to be in the area. So for example, the Swainson's thrush, something like your, uh, a more um, a missile thrush maybe in, in your world, uh, is, is found at, at areas that have land cover up to about 40% urban development. Beyond that, they're quite rare. Uh, beyond, below that area, they're, they're quite common. And likewise, if we go down to an even rarer species, which is our warbler here, found up to only about 6% urban land cover and then very rarely found in areas with more than that. And this is a handy way, I think, to make this sort of matrix for um, species in your region. So you might anticipate which species could uh, tolerate a given style of development. So for in our case, you could get robins, which are like your blackbird, um, jays, uh, like your, your jay and some titmice quite easily in any style of development. And what we should maybe aim for is not just these species, which we can get, but a couple of these, a couple of the ones that are more difficult to obtain. What could we do to provide enough um, non-built uh, lands for some of these species to make it? Um, and depending on the size of their home range, that uh, might be easier or more difficult to, to provide. So let's talk about the ecology and evolution within the city now that we've been studying in our birds. And the first thing is that there's, there's predation, there's competition, there's parasitism, there's all of the ecological processes that we're familiar with, but there's one that I think is, is fun to focus on and that's facilitation. So this is a facilitator in our system and it could be the green woodpecker in your system, but in ours it's the uh, red-breasted sapsucker. This species drills small holes like these in this birch tree that secrete, um, secrete uh, wax and um, syrup that other animals eat. Um, they are able to uh, use the sap to flow them basically that comes out of these holes. And there's a whole diversity of insects that utilize these. Uh, and of course the woodpecker does as well. They also drill bigger holes to nest in and sleep in and other species, titmice and, and species like that utilize those uh, cavities as well. So this animal facilitates a lot of biodiversity. And so keeping it in the, in the built environment gets a lot more than just this one particular animal, which is very tolerant of, of human development as well. And there's another important facilitator in this system. And, and here it's illustrated by our ability to attract hummingbirds, but that's humans. Humans facilitate the um, existence of many species in, in urban areas. And that Anna's hummingbird that the Jack has drawn here has increased in range from California up through uh, parts of British Columbia now year round uh, because of the feeders we provide, because of the plants that bloom now year round here on the West Coast of the United States. So humans are important facilitators as well. And uh, Michael alluded to some of our work with crows. I'll take a bit of a diversion and talk about that because this is a species we facilitate quite directly and, and surprisingly uh, strongly in some areas. They're kind of a species that's hated or loved. And I think it's the same. We, we actually did some surveys in Berlin and found the same sorts of attitudes, though not as polarizing as here in the US. But here's a woman sitting on our campus who's, who's feeding these birds. She's walked about a mile. They followed her, walking behind her, flying in front of her, acting like pets uh, for her. And she's sitting contemplating uh, their activities and they're waiting for a peanut or two from her for food. And we did experiments where we tested whether they could recognize particular people 
We did this by wearing this crazy face and a bunch of others, but this ex exaggerated face when we caught some birds. And so those birds we suspected would learn the caveman as being dangerous. And we compared the behavior when they saw the caveman to when they saw us wearing a different mask, which was our vice president at the time, Dick Cheney. So we walk around campus wearing either of these masks and we record the reaction of the birds to us. And we would expect them to attack or flee when they saw the caveman and not care when they saw Dick Cheney. And in fact, that's what they do. Uh, before we did any trapping, we saw very little response to the, of the birds to either just a person without a mask, the Dick Cheney mask, uh, or, um, or the caveman. And we wore the caveman with a hat uh, when we actually caught our birds. So no response before, not much response to Cheney after, no response to no mask after, but a big response to the caveman after, even if we wore it upside down. They would turn their heads sometimes and look at us up, look at that mask upside down. They recognized it as danger. And that uh, is indicated by the kind of activity they did when they saw us. They would scold us, they would dive at us, they would chase us and escort us out of their territory, just like they would a predator uh, that was in their territory. And even though I gave, I gave this talk 10 years ago that Michael saw, we were about here on this graph, about halfway. Uh, we've continued this experiment and our birds still respond, although the response is declining to seeing this face on our campus now 15 years after we caught those birds. And we only caught seven individuals. And yet when we walk on campus, it's not unusual to have 20 or more birds attacking and scolding us. As, as Michael alluded to, they've, they've learned this through a process of cultural uh, transmission of information and developed what I call a culture of hate uh, for this guy when they see him on campus. And even though we only walk once a year, the birds are right there to scold us when I step out of my office and, and head down the road. Um, so they, they have keen memories. We now know this memory also is housed uh, in their brain in the same place you would house a memory that you learned in your brain. So this is a pet image of a crow's brain as they're out looking at this dangerous face. Now, there's a lot of activation in the visual cortex, the bright areas here and in their retinas, uh, the backs of the eye, but also in the amygdala and the right hemisphere of the bird's amygdala, which is the same place your right hemisphere that would be activated if you were in an experiment looking out and seeing something you learned was dangerous. So these animals, even though they're distantly related to us and have brains organized very differently than ours, they use the parts of the brain to do similar tasks that we use our parts of the brain for. And, and recognizing that I, I think helps us understand and maybe relate to them a little bit better. They're not all that foreign uh, from us. There's one, one microphone on, someone could switch off the microphone. Okay, this was from Italy, probably. I was going to say, I got some, I had an Italian talking in my head for a little while there. I, yeah. I wish I could have understood. It was probably <laughs> Stanley Tucci just being in Venice eating some nice things. Yeah, probably. Oh, gosh. All right, so a little bit more about the ecology of what's going on in our areas. And we, we look at this by looking at three different kinds of sites. Reserves, those watersheds, the far right side of that first curve I showed you that have mostly forest around them. Uh, developing areas that are being developed, this forest is gonna be converted into part of this development and other subdivisions that have been developed for uh, 50 to 100 years. So in these developing areas where I'll focus my uh, discussion, change is rapid and it's extreme. And I think this is important to keep in mind as you think about designing places. A, sub, a spot that looked like this one year looks like this the next. These are the same places, same here. So if you're a bird that uses this dead tree or the shrubbery, you've had quite a change in your lifetime. And we were curious about how they might adapt to that. What would they do? And in general, what happens when we build an area is that we increase the amount of edge, that's the red line, over time here of our study. 
uh, from the late 90s to the, to the uh, mid 2000s. Um, increase in edge, reduction in forest, and an increase in built and more open space as what the other is, mostly shrub and grass sorts of lands. It's still, our study sites are still predominantly forest, even after 12 years of development. That's because of the, the matrix, the setting that our city is within. But in response to that change, we see a great change in the birds that live there. So I'll, I'll just give you an example of one avoider, this small wren, and one adapter or exploiter, really, the dark-eyed junco. And what we see here in, in these graphs is just a time course of our study. We look at the number of birds in the uh, built areas already, the subdivisions that exist. Those are the gray uh, bars here, those study sites that remain. They were built from the start and they remained built. Those forests, which were our reserve areas that were forest at the start and at the end of our study. And then those changing sites, the developments that were being made. So here's the change in the wrens as development is producing more edge and less forest. And their numbers are declining because this is a forest specialist. They started off just like in our forest sites, they ended up just like in our suburban developed sites. And just the opposite for the adapter, the junco. Numbers increase as we build and they go from uh, being rare like they are in the forest to being common like they are in the subdivision. So it just, just shows the causal relationship. We change the landscape, we cause plant succession. In your model, you see bird succession in response. And actually, Jack, the, my last student, I like that you had succession in your graph because that's a topic basically of his dissertation. And what he's showing is that succession is arrested. It stops in our urban areas, at least up to this point. We don't uh, have the uh, disturbance that eventually will succeed back to allowing wrens, the forest species, to live there. Instead, we stay at a place that allows juncos. We've looked at uh, the lifespan of our birds as well and their breeding success. I'll tell you quickly what's going on there. So with, with bird lifespan, big birds you would expect to live longer than small birds. And that's what this uh, space here shows, just uh, the expectation of annual mortality or survival as a function of body size. And for those two species, we see that juncos have the expected survivorship in those developments, that's where they thrive. And wrens have their expected development in those areas that have mostly forest, both the reserve and the developing areas, which still retain quite a lot of forest. So one of the important reasons why they're there, why that diversity persists is that we're allowing them to live and survive there. Not so much breeding, uh, that, doesn't, that is, wasn't affected much by how much of the different um, amount of forest we had in an area, for example. So whether birds nest on the ground or in shrubs or in holes in trees, cavities, um, those, those bars in all of these cases are very similar, whether they were in neighborhoods, in developing areas or in forests. And if anything, their success at breeding was lower in forests than it was in the development. And that was something that other studies have shown um, was more of a limiting factor, not so much survivorship like we've seen, but breeding success. And then you had arrows coming out of your model with animals leaving and coming into the system. And that's what we're looking at here in terms of dispersal. Where do breeders go when uh, habitat is changed around them? Uh, and how much do they move from one territory to the next from year to year as they breed? These animals all develop territories, they sing to maintain those territories and attract mates. And what we see is the adapters. So in our case, some of the wrens, the junco is right here, the dark-eyed junco. These animals <clears throat> don't move much at all. You know, from year to year, only about 50 meters from one place to the next where they're carrying out their breeding activities. And if anything, they move most in the reserves where it's all forest. And you would that kind of makes sense. They've got more options to move around there. Avoiders, on the other hand, here's our Pacific Wren that I showed you their numbers declining. They move a lot in these developing areas. And that's because their territory, which was all forest, has just been cut down 
and they have to go somewhere and they end up going uh, hundreds of meters to find a new patch of forest someplace. So as we change that habitat within our, in your planning zone, some of these animals are gonna leave. Others might just move around a little bit or stay still actually is what most of these birds do. They just hang right in there and use that new resource that our building provides. <clears throat> and then there's evolution. And this is something I think we could celebrate in our cities. Uh, and this is an example of evolution of blackbird behavior in this case, not your blackbird, ours, sorry, different, different kind of bird. But this is a, at a large shopping center just outside of my house here, uh, a mile or two down the road. And I was interested in studying these birds because they nest in the parking lots, in the shrubs that are around the parking lot. And I couldn't figure out how they could even live there. There's not much and it's very dangerous. Um, and so I went to study them and there were no birds there early in the morning, but at 10 o'clock, which is when the store opens, the birds came in and they perched like these guys right outside the door. And soon as the store opened its doors, these birds flew inside and they were in there eating the, the spilled foods from the food court and, and in the warm, dry environment, uh, which is a good contrast to the outside here uh, that provides a place for these. And in Europe, it's been demonstrated now, several species starting to occupy buildings inside and even carrying out breeding activities in there. So this is a new eco part of the ecolope for you to, to think about. Other species like the junco that I've mentioned a few times now have not uh, have been able to survive with us, but they've changed their um, phenotypes. In this case, uh, they've changed the amount of white in their outer tail feathers because females that select mates in urban areas prefer males with less white in their tail because they're less aggressive and more caring of their young. And that's important in the city where these birds can nest four or five times in a year because it's warmer and less predators. And in the wild, females prefer males like this guy with a lot of white uh, because that's an aggressive male that's able to defend its space quite effectively. So female choice has driven a change in the number of feathers that are white, uh, which is a genetic trait in this species. In just a few years, in two decades, a, a significant change in the tail uh, composition. And you, I'm sure you're familiar with changes in the song that birds have. In the cities where it's noisy, birds sing at higher pitches, louder, and in more staccato uh, tempo. So they get their message. Again, this is my space. I'm, I'm interested in you as a mate uh, out in, in a noisy environment but they have to expend more energy to do so. And that might cost them in some cases. <clears throat> We've even helped the evolution of a species. The Italian sparrow is a product of hybridization between house sparrows and Spanish sparrows. And these two species came into contact as, as humans finally migrated over the Alps into uh, Northern Italy. And with them came the house sparrow and not having many house sparrows at that time because there weren't many people and migration stalled or, or um, increased depending upon snow cover, uh, these animals started interbreeding with the native Spanish sparrows and produced this hybrid, which um, is able to build up a large enough population to select mates of its own that look like it and therefore isolate the gene pool of this spe species, which now occupies most of Italy and uh, create this new species because of our movements, which this animal followed. So we often think of us as disruptive and we certainly are extremely disruptive, but sometimes we facilitate in this case, the creation of a species. And, and the animals that live in the city, not only are carrying out neat ecological and evolutionary tricks, they're also beautiful. And this is a species, one of my favorites, a thrush like your blackbird. This is our Swainson's thrush, builds a beautiful nest of moss and lines it with the skeletonized leaves of alder. So again, thinking about interpreting the city uh, in your building areas for the people that live there, making them aware of some of these sorts of uh, beautiful structures that birds or other animals build, I think could be, um, can be very helpful. So let me talk about sustaining 
some of these uh, wonders and I'll look at habitat, keeping it safe and engaging people. These might be things that are, that are useful for you to think about. Lawns are a, a large detriment to, to almost all species. They're biological deserts, but just by letting them grow up and not mowing them regularly, leaving them a little rough in some places, it's like here, this is my backyard now. Um, you enable other species to occur there, these blue flowers and the pollinators that are pollinating those, the amphibians that, that nest in this or move through the grass and even those juncos that will breed in that grass. So just not mowing everything, keeping things a little rough uh, can help. Providing food, uh, here's the junco that I've been talking about, eating at a feeder. Um, some other species will come in here. These are all in a suburban setting. And again, we've, we've done this at one of the shopping centers uh, downtown here to just allow people to see and experience the diversity that's around them that can live with us. And it helps some of these populations maintain size and therefore evolutionary potential in, in face of our activities. And, and this is a benefit to the, to the, uh, to the coffers of our um, budgets in these cities. So for example, in Berlin, we calculated at this, when we did this Sorry, study a few could years you say ago, that again? My apologies. Um, we calculated uh, $70 million a year people in Berlin were spending on feeding birds and, uh, and more than that here. And I'm sure that's an underestimate. Creating nest boxes also, nesting opportunities, leaving some dead trees, critical resource for woodpeckers and other species. Uh, providing diversity of habitats in an area. So not having a separate reserve and completely built area. I think that's one tendency we, we, we'd see in some of the cities in Asia, I'm thinking in particular, and, uh, but rather mixing things up. That's what leads, leads to that high diversity that we documented. And in our case, we could have the Pacific Wren and a competitor, the Buick's Wren, if we provide both sorts of habitats. Highways are difficult for some animals to cross, not so much for birds, but for amphibians like the spotted salamander. So providing walkways underneath or over the top of, of roads is an important thing um, that, we, that we have learned here quite a lot uh, for mammals and for amphibians and reptiles to traverse our cities. For us here, connecting land and water is, is key. We're in a wet regime. So where we have uh, water or where you have runoff areas from cities, that's a place where habitats can occur that a lot of species will use to move in and out of the city. Salmon in our case, moving in and out. Creating a safe space. So uh, if you can do anything to keep cats out of your ecolope, the diversity of birds will appreciate that. They're the number one killer of birds worldwide. They kill about 10% of all of our birds here in the United States every year. You can keep them on a leash. Got to appreciate, oh, I guess I don't have the video here, sorry. Uh, but you can leash your pets, even, even cats and dogs, of course, the same. Uh, you can build spaces for them. The other important thing to avoid in, in our built areas are reflective windows or those that are easily seen through. There's 10 dead birds here underneath this window that I saw in New Orleans. And these birds were attracted thinking they could fly to this tree, which is just a reflection of one on the outside. Um, others see that as a passageway. So creating uh, unique ways to uh, shield the windows to have patterns of ultraviolet reflective dots on them like you, you've seen um, to make them less, um, to make them look more permanent, more uh, impassable to a bird is the key thing. And recognizing where there are the most dangers out there. Reducing lighting uh, can affect a lot of species, a lot of aquatic species in particular. So having lights turned down instead of facing up, when you think about that design element can be beneficial. Celebrating the predators that live there. You may have uh, some, some wild cats or wild uh, canids, dogs, coyotes that we have here in the US um, that live in these areas um, that are important for the animals to interact with and, and to keep some of the species um, 
at, at lower numbers. So for example, celebrating the peregrine falcons and, and goshawks that come into your European cities is uh, something that, um, that will be very beneficial to the overall diversity of birds there. <clears throat> and then finally, sustaining the human connection. And I know that's what you guys are all about. But to me, sustaining this connection, um, especially among young kids, is very important. And whether they're out there trying to catch a pigeon or observing some great rare species that might live in their city, like a peregrine or a goshawk, um, just getting their attention and allowing them to interact freely with these animals, um, I think is very important to build the connections that I hope would lead them to their for value the other species in the city and, and those beyond the city, like that tapir that I started with. And I will just end with this quote from Aldo Leopold. He was a wildlife scientist here in the United States who thought about um, how people might learn to conserve uh, animals and plants, especially in agricultural settings. And I think this is very much relevant to cities as well. And, and his point is that we can't really learn to love and respect the land until we see it as a community and not just a commodity. And I hope some of the work we've done has shown the rich community of birds, at least, that, that we have in the city with us, and that would allow us to, to respect and love that diversity a bit more than just seeing the value in that built space. There are various connections you guys can get to to get some of the um, scientific papers that we published on this. The website there um, has that, <clears throat> has links to those papers that you can get, or I can certainly supply anything else that, that you guys would need. But with that, I, I would be glad to, again, thank you for having me here and also um, answer any questions that you might have.